Lenten season is a time of fasting and consecration. We are called to prayerfully consider the sacrificial love of Jesus Christ, receive it, share it, and demonstrate it to others. We repent from our sins and offer our hearts to God with a renewed commitment to Him. There is no better way to reset our spiritual compass and bring about spiritual renewal in every area of our lives than through prayer and fasting. Lenten season 2021 begins on February 17th.
never tells me when. Ooh. Just when he's gonna, when he's gonna fix it. Testament reading come from the book of Psalm, Psalm 22, verses 22 through verse 31. Psalm 22, 22 through 31. I will declare your name to my people. In the assembly, I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you descendants of Jacob, honor him. Revere him all you descendants of Israel, for he has not despised or scorned the suffering of the afflicted one. He has not hidden his face from him, but has listened to his cry for help. For you comes the theme of my praise in the great assembly. Before those who fear you, I will fulfill my vows. The poor will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek the Lord will praise him. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will bow down before him. For dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the rich of the earth will feast and worship. All who go down to the dust will kneel before him, those who cannot keep themselves alive 
prosperity will serve him. Future generations will, talk, will be told about the Lord. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people yet unborn, he has done it. Our New Testament reading will come from the book of Romans, chapter 4, verses 18 through 25. Against all hope, Abraham in hope believed, and so became the father of many nations. Just as it had been said to him, so shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his face, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead, since he was about a hundred years old. And that Sarah's womb was also dead, yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us to whom God will credit righteousness for us, who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy and eternal God, praise and glory belong to you. Be merciful and gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways. Bring them again with contrite hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. Jesus Christ, your son, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever. Father, we give you special thanks for all that you've done for us through the years. And even as we have celebrated the reflection of this month, those of monumental significance whose lives were given for the sake of liberty and justice for all. We ultimately give you all the praise and glory for how far we've come. We ask that you continue to lead and guide us as we, as a community and nation, navigate through the continual COVID-19 crisis. We pray that you give strength and wisdom to those who work in the medical and pharmaceutical field. Give them hope that their sacrifice will give way to a world without COVID-19. Touch the heart of every citizen of the general population to respect the mandate to wear masks and socially distance themselves. Lord, bless those who are stricken with illnesses and those who have lost loved ones. Sean and Andrea Talbert, Janet and Harold Kennard, Willie and Taliba Smith, Thomas and Ollie Smith, Elgin and Paula Joyner, Barry and Gwendolyn Clark, the family of Penny Meshaw Sitch, Rosemary Caldwell, Betty de Graffenwright, the family of Minnie West, Betty and Donald Williams, Leo Mays, Rosemary and Ricky Bryant, Juliet and Mark Spivey, Rosetta and Wayne Oliver, Betty Emmanuel Jackson, comfort their hearts and grant them peace. Father, we ask your continued precipitation of loving grace upon our pastor, Raph Douglas West, his wife, Sister Sharita West and their family. Provide them the strength and wisdom for the journey. Bless our church leadership, staff, congregation, first time friends and guests. In the matchless name of Jesus, amen.
Good morning, church family. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. How many glad saints do we have this morning? Praise the Lord. Church family, one of our guests this morning is the praise team of Lunga Baptist Church of Cape Town, South Africa. Dr. C. Poe Zundi, pastor. Please help me welcome them as they share with us this morning. Sanbalani, greeting saints in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We are the praise and worship team all the way from Langa Baptist Church, South Africa in Cape Town. We love you and we are so honored to be part of the celebration. We're going to render a song. All it says is go away, which means he is the only resurrected Savior. Amen. Enjoy and be blessed.
to God be the glory for the great things he has done. We're so honored, so honored to have our beloved family from South Africa joining us, Pastor Sifo Zunde, Lady Zunde, and the Longa Baptist Church family. We love them. They are our sister church. We're the church without walls, and they are the church without limits. Let's thank God for Longa Baptist Church. Amen. They're actually streaming with us this morning, so we want to say hello to all of you, our brothers and sisters in Cape Town. God bless you. Uh, we are closing out Black History Month, but I tell you what, guess what? Every day is black history. Amen? Amen. Because black history is American history, and it is our history. We want to say welcome to you, and thank you for bringing God's house into your house. We want to invite you to like and share, invite somebody else to worship with you this morning. And we certainly want to thank God for everyone who is joining us from all over the world as well as here even within uh, the United States. We want to say welcome you, uh, Janine Rankins, who's streaming this morning from Phoenix, Arizona, and Lynette Scott, who's streaming from Dallas, and TJ Williams, who's streaming from Louisiana. We want to say thank you for those who are watching from South Africa and the Bahamas and Finland and Norway and South America. We want to say thank you to those who are streaming with us from Canada and Sri Lanka, all over the world. They're watching with us this morning because we are the church without walls. Amen? Amen. And then we want to say congratulations to those who are celebrating their wedding anniversaries this morning, uh, celebrating 25 years, Danny and Barbara Latin, 25 years, celebrating 39 years, Edwin and Cheryl Graves, amen, 39 years, and then celebrating 50 years, Charles and Barbara Stiles. Let's thank God for our couples and happy anniversary to you. Parents, we want to remind you that we do have special worship services for our children and youth, so make sure that you head on over, send them over to watch the worship services and participate uh, in worshiping God this morning with our KWOW kids as well as our Ignite youth. And adults, we want to remind you that our small groups, Bible studies have begun. You can go to sgbs.tcww.org. That's sgbs.tcww.org, and make sure that you get registered and jump into those small groups. We've begun a new Bible study on Wednesdays, uh, so I know that you're excited about that. Make sure that you join our general Bible studies. And this Tuesday night, we are closing out uh, One Spirit, One Body, the study through the book of Ephesians. We've had an amazing time with South Main Baptist Church, and we thank God for the vision of our pastors, Pastor Ralph Douglas West and uh, Pastor Steve Wells. And so make sure that you head on over there. Now, listen, I know if you're anything like me, the storm kind of threw off your rhythm, but we are in the season of Lent. And Right, yes, we are fasting and we are praying. We're fasting and we're praying. We're consecrating for 40 days. And we want you to join us in this period of consecration. You can go to the Church Without Walls website and download the Lenten version. Uh, and if you haven't begun already, guess what? It is a great time to start. Amen? We're fasting and praying. We're seeking God's face. How many of you have a need that you're trusting God for? And even besides that, this is just a time that we go grow closer to the Lord, where we put aside our own desires and seek God's face. Sometimes God doesn't, uh, we can't hear him until we get into a quiet place. And that's exactly what we want to do in this Lenten season. If you have a special prayer request, we want to invite you to go to our Church Without Walls website. Click on, and there you will see a link for a prayer request. And you can submit your prayer request there. And if you have a special need for your family, uh, you will also be able to go to the link on our Church Without website for members and click on who is my deacon. And our deacons will be glad uh, to stand in agreement with you uh, in prayer. Uh, church family, we want to say thank you uh, 
uh, so much for continuing to being the Church Without Walls light in the midst of darkness and in our community. We thank God for the vision of our pastor uh, to serve our community. And we were able, by the grace of God, to uh, distribute over 4,200 cases of water uh, this past Friday. Amen. 4,200 cases of water. And we also were able to distribute food and masks and hand sanitizers. We were able to serve our elementary schools, the schools that are near us. They sent their teachers over so we can make sure that they had uh, as well. And so we want to thank God for our mayor, Sylvester Turner, uh, Commissioner Jack R. Cagle, uh, Harris County Precinct 4, our staff, our volunteers, and Momentum Men. Thank you for the brothers from Kappa Alpha Psi and the Alpha Brothers. Thank you to Calvin and Patricia Henderson. Listen, their son is a member of our church, Calvin Robertson, and they drove a U-Haul all the way from Punchatoula, Louisiana, filled with supplies so that we could give them to our community. Let's thank God uh, for them. Now, so guess what? The journey uh, is still on. We have a lot of families to support and help, so thank you uh, for those who have contributed to our disaster relief and recovery effort, and for those who'd like to, you can go to our webpage and you will see information there. Uh, listen, church family, we've been on this mission and partnering with the Houston Health Department for the hashtag Better Together campaign as it relates to COVID-19. We are still in the midst of COVID, which means we still have to wear our mask, practice social distancing, wash your hands, use hand sanitizer, but we're excited today to be able to announce a new partnership uh, with the Houston Methodists uh, who will be providing uh, vaccines to our community. So listen carefully. If you are 50, 5, 0, 50 years old or older, 50 years old or older, go to this website, vaccine dot tcww.org vaccine dot tcww.org you have until 5 p.m today until 5 p.m today to register uh, to receive the vaccine uh, someone from the methodist hospital will contact you and through text messaging so make sure you fill in all the details that they request it's a very simple form only take you about two minutes uh, make sure you put all the information in there. They will send you a text message letting you know when uh, you can take your vaccine. So vaccine.tcww.org. You must be in this first phase 50 years old or older. 50 years old or older. So make sure that you do that today before 5 p.m. And here's what they're asking of us. Two things. Number one. If you take the first dose of vaccine, please make sure that you go back to the same location and take the second dose. That's the first thing. The second thing they're asking us to do is that if you set an appointment, please fulfill the appointment because otherwise those vaccines could go to somebody else who has a need and who wants it. So that's our social responsibility and we thank God for our community partners. Now, as we close out Black History Month, and again, every day is Black History, we want to welcome uh, our young KY sister, Claire Jones, uh, as she prepares immediately after the choir scenes to give us our Black History moment. Peace be unto you. <laughs>
spent my entire life breaking glass ceilings with two decades in public life. It all started in Oakland, California, where I was born in October of 1964 to immigrant parents. My parents divorced and me and my sister were raised by our mother who exposed us to the civil rights movement. After high school, I attended Howard University an HBCU school in Washington, D.C., and then I received my law degree. I quickly started building a long list of accomplishments that I would be the first ever to achieve. I became the first black woman to be California's district attorney, the first woman to be California's attorney general, and the first Indian American senator. I have a wonderful husband and two loving stepchildren that call me Mama. With the wind behind my sail, I decided boldly in 2019 to run for President of the United States of America. I gave a good run and I didn't win Democratic primary, but I proved I was capable. This led to Joe Biden choosing me as his running mate, and what a glorious day that was. I have something to add. Excuse me. Miss Vice President, I'm speaking. I'm speaking. On November 7th, 2020, I remember that phone call with the president elect like it was yesterday. We did it, Joe, we did it. You're gonna be the next president of the United States of America. On January 20th, 2021, I became the first African American, the first woman, and the first Indian American to be vice president of the United States of America. I may be the first woman in this office, but I will not be the last. I am Kamala Harris. Praise the Lord, church family. Our guest soloist this morning has performed as a soloist in operas, oratorios, and recitals at venues throughout the United States, Europe, and Asia. As a member of the acclaimed cast of Three Mo Tenors, he sang a wide variety of musical genres, including opera, Broadway, jazz, and Motown. He is a professor of music, chairman of the Department of Music, an interim assistant dean of the College of Liberal Arts and Behavioral Sciences at Texas Southern University. According to the Washington Post, special praise is in order for Jason Obie's golden toned solo work. His voice is accurate, flexible, and true. A real pleasure to listen to. Church Without Walls, as we prepare to hear the word of God, please welcome with me, Dr. Jason Obi. church for to sing and shout way in the middle of the air before six months these all turned out way in the middle of the air let me tell you what the hypocrite will do way in the middle of the air he'll talk about me and he'll talk about you way in the middle of the air Ezekiel saw the wheel way up in the middle of the air Ezekiel saw the wheel way in the middle of the air run by faith 
wheel, we'll run by the grace of God. A wheel in a wheel, way in the middle of the air. Let me pray for you don't need, way in the middle of the air. The Lord don't like no sin and greed, way in the middle of the air. There's one sure thing that you can't do, way in the middle of the air. You can't serve God and Satan too, way in the middle of the air. Ezekiel saw the wheel, way up in the middle of the air. Ezekiel saw the wheel, way in the middle of the air. The big wheel run by faith, the little wheel run by the grace of God. A wheel in a wheel, way in the middle of the air. One of these days, about 12 o'clock, way in the middle of the air. ...today and blessing us with this uh, beautiful spiritual Ezekiel saw wheel way up in the middle of the air. Our prayer is, is that churches would recover this beautiful genre of music and not limit it to one segment of the year. I was reflecting in my own time of study and reflection and listening to the spirituals anew of how many missed opportunities we have had at funerals and different uh, celebrations to be reminded of how God is involved in our human situation. So thank you uh, for today. Ezekiel saw the wheel way up in the middle of the air. If you would take the word of God with me and open it to Ezekiel chapter 1, to chapter 2, verse 2, you'll read where Ezekiel saw a wheel way up in the middle of the air. Ezekiel chapter 1 to chapter 2, verse 2, this is the word of God. You may be seated, you may sit back at home. God can come to you effortlessly wherever you are. That's what the wonderful spiritual reminds us of is that when the enslaved and then those that would pass that music down, to those that would live in Reconstruction and under black codes and Jim Crow and civil rights, to this very moment, it reminds us when we sing it, Ezekiel saw a wheel way up in the middle of an air, in the air, it reminds us that wherever you are, God, can come to you. Theology is what we do when we talk about God. And I was reading through some of the lines of this wonderful spiritual, reminding us of God's coming to us. And in one rendering, it speaks of Ezekiel seeing the wheel way up in the middle of the air. And then he says, who's that dressed in white? This must be the children of the Israelites. Or who's that dressed in red? This must be Israelites that Moses led. Or who's that dressed in black? Might be those that are going back. A reminder of how God is leading us on the journey. But in other renditions, talk about Ezekiel seeing the wheel way up in the middle of the air. And it depends on Who's trying to interpret these spirituals? I heard one nun African American interpret this, and she said she didn't know exactly who the writers were referring to when they talked about these hypocrites who will talk about you and then talk about me. But if you would ask the people that constructed this, the double meaning that they would have behind this spiritual would be those that talk about God and freedom out of one side of their mouth and those that talk about enslavement and oppression on the other side of their mouth. They need to see Ezekiel's will way up in the middle of the air. But when they sang it, they knew that God had not forgotten them exactly where they are. Here, here's something else that's arresting about 
comparing what we're about to study in Ezekiel chapter 1 primarily and a reference to chapter 2 verses 1 through 2 is where did they get this incredible insight to speak of the attributes of God in this particular way? Three big words that theologians use and now it's pretty regular around the church when people talk about the omnipotence or the omniscience or they talk about omnipresence of God. That God is all powerful and God is everywhere and God knows everything. Maybe they learned it without knowing those words by hearing maybe somebody read the story that you and I are about to look at for just a moment. One July after the Israelites have been carted off into Babylonian captivity, the heavens split wide open and there was this revealed vision of this most descriptive scene of a chariot and throne and creatures more descriptive than any other lengthy description than any other vision in all of the scriptures it's more detailed than Moses encounter with the burning bush it's more descriptive than the night visitors wrestling with Jacob by the river of Jabbok it's more detailed than Isaiah's picture of seeing Uzziah lifted up in that year, rather, when Uzziah died and, and you saw the angels and the smoke and the trembling portals in the temple. It's more insightful even than the midday revelation of Paul as he rocks down toward the Damascus. There's only one other vision that compares to it, and I may mention it later. Here's why we need this kind of vision of God to refocus, recalibrate, even reshape our life to let us have a new vision of what life looks like. It's what Martin Luther King Jr. would talk about in one of his favorite speeches, your blueprint for life. When we're to be reminded not only of our somebodiness and our worth, but to remember that that worth of somebodiness comes from a grand God that gives us the morals and ethics and the love necessary to overcome hate and oppression and disappointment that confronts us. It is this kind of scene in this summer desert storm that Ezekiel will see something that would so arrest him, but it would remind him more than anything else that God can come to him effortlessly wherever he might be. As you look at these verses now with me, you begin to pick up that without a mentioning of it, that Ezekiel points to the different ways, or should I say even times and places in which we can meet God. Have you noticed that we can meet God under all kinds of circumstances, but normally we don't meet God on top of the mountain. It's usually down in the valley. We don't meet him in the bright sunlight, but many times in the dark shadows. Not in the major key of life, but in the minor key of life. It doesn't mean that these are the only times that God can get our attention, but for some reason it seems to be those are the times that we encounter God the most. Moments in which we meet God in these peculiar times. Look with me now as we look through these verses or the vision of God, that's verse number one, in which it arrests the imagination of Ezekiel. But now we begin to 
probe into some things into the life of Ezekiel. And that is, he is about to see in the split heaven this enormous vision that reminds him that God can come to you at any time and wherever you might be. And think about how God can come to us. I see mobility. I see majesty. I see God's glory. Look at these verses now. Really from verse 5 to around verse 14 at what's going to happen. Well, verses 1 through 5 of what's going to happen first. Is that you see how God meets Ezekiel and where God meets him. He actually meets him in spite of being in a place where he never intended to be. <laughs> Ezekiel has been taken away from Jerusalem and he's been brought to Babylon. And what's strange about this relocation is that it home at home in Jerusalem that's where God dwells and now he's been carted off and carried into this particular place at home in Jerusalem that's where God lives in Babylon this is where in quotes God has abandoned at home is the place of reconciliation here in Babylon is alienation that's what Ezekiel thought but he will soon learn quickly that even when your locations have changed and new settlements have been given to you, that God can come to you right where you are. That's good news. That, that's what this vision actually reminds us of, is that when your life situations have changed, God can. Come to you where you are. But not only in spite of being in a place that he was not accustomed to, but in light of a change of all life circumstances. Ezekiel had carved out his life in a very comfortable way. He is the son of a priest. He had been preparing for the last five years for priestly responsibilities in the temple. Here he would exercise standing before God on behalf of the people. And now God has changed not just his location but also his vocation. He who was a priest has now become a prophet. As a priest he would be one that would be limited to stand in the temple. But as a prophet he would have to speak everywhere. In the temple he would serve God with his back turned to the congregation, but as a prophet, he would have to stand face to face before the people. In the temple, as the priest, he would offer sacrifice and absolution for sins, but now as a prophet, he would have to proclaim words of repentance. Life would change for him. And more than that, God would make Ezekiel put on ocular demonstrations. He would live out many times the prophecies in which he would have to preach. In fact, some of these things that he's asked to do are borderline profane. And yet God says, put on this demonstration. Cook a meal and cook it over the excrement of humans. Use misogynistic language to describe the unfaithfulness of my nation. Pack your tote bag, dig a hole in the wall, climb, climb through it, and then go on the other side as a reminder of how I will lead you out from comfort into discomfort. But in all of that, I want you to be a prophet to proclaim judgment upon the nation and a priest at the same time in which you will intercede on behalf of the nation. Be an intermediary on one side and an intercessor on the other side. Stand there and plead before God. God can come to you at that moment, but God can also come to you despite losing the most cherished things that you possess. When you read through Ezekiel's writing, 
you come to chapter 28 and he's putting on a demonstration. He preaches during the day. And there's a line in that chapter that reminds you that he preached in the morning and his wife died in the evening. While serving, he loses the most cherished possession that he has. You see, it's one thing to be carted away from Jerusalem into Babylon alone, but he has the companionship of his beloved and now that has been taken away from him. And he experiences the deepest level of loss. God can come to you in these difficult moments of your life. Do you see what this, these first five verses really are tailored to teach us? It reminds us that God is not geographically bound to any particular location, that God can come to you wherever you are. This happened one August, steamy, hot summer in Southside Chicago. Thomas Dorsey was reaching a kind of popularity for his music. He was a jazz musician that had turned gospel singer. He had always had relationship with the church, but now he has come full-throated, committed to the church. In this August of 1932, he's invited to go to St. Louis as the guest soloist for a revival. He didn't really want to go. His wife, Nettie, was pregnant. She was just a few days away from delivering that child, and so he didn't want to go, but she encouraged him to go, and he went, and he was going to come right back. And so while he's performing at the revival and trying to sit down, and people are asking him to sing more and sing more, in a secular way, the word would be, encore, but they're asking him to sing more, and he sings, and when he finishes, he sits down, and he gets this telegram that just simply says, your wife has died. He gets back to Chicago as fast as he can, and Nettie has died, but the baby is born and lives, and so he's torn between the tension of Joy on one hand of the birth of the child and pain and sadness on the other hand of the loss of Nettie. But then joy would turn into painful sorrow that night when his son would die. He would bury them in the same casket together and he had almost lost faith and hope. If this is what it means to serve God. Maybe I need to go back to the world of jazz. Maybe I need to go back to secular. If this is what it means to sign up with God. And a week later, a friend from the music school just came by and took him over to the school. No long conversations. He had already made up his mind by now to abandon God. To go back. God had abandoned him. His friend sat in one of the professors, Dr. Fry, put him in this little room with a piano, and he just began to rub his hands over the keys. He remembered a medley from growing up, and he started hammering out, and he started putting words to it. Precious Lord, Take my hand. Lead me on. Let me stand. I am tired. I am weak. I am worn. Through the night, lead me on to thy light. Precious Lord, take my hand. Lead me on. We meet God who meets us in those dark moments of life to remind us that even when our location, our vocation, our companionship has changed, God knows how to come to us right where we are. How apropos is this vision to us this morning to be reminded 
that God can come to us. Is that not where many people are right now at this present moment? That they're at that very moment in which we need to know that God can faithfully come to us. So when somebody says to you and says, can you believe that that church is singing Ezekiel saw the wheel way up in the middle of the air. Ezekiel saw the wheel way up in the middle of the air and they laugh beneath their breath. Excuse them for their ignorance. Pardon them because they don't understand that here these writers were trying to do exactly what Ezekiel was trying to do. Ezekiel knew of the poverty of human language. The beauty of poetry, it allows you to be flexible and free. To use imagination. It may not be always historically accurate, but that's okay. It allows you to playfully imagine this very real revelation that reminds us whatever Ezekiel saw and however he tried to describe it, it reminds us that God way up there can come way down here and can fit into our human situation and not leave us by ourselves. Verses 5 through verse 15. What Ezekiel sees now is the picture that God is Lord over everything. That's what he really sees when he sees this image, a vision. It points to him that God is Lord over everything. And we need, in times like these, a big vision of God. That's what comes to mind when I read Ezekiel 1, is that whatever he saw and however he tried to describe it, he was saying that God is bigger than creation. God is Lord over all creation. I, I, I wish that I had paid stricter attention in science to understand the, the constellation or the universe. I'll let you in on something that I do sometimes. I will go out Normally it's away from Houston because the lights of Houston dims the lights in the sky. But during this period of being away, I've had a chance to look in some dark moments to see the bright stars in the sky. And every time I look up, it reminds me of how big God is and how little I am. And then it reminds me that big God can handle my little problems. <laughs> Look at this vision with me now, verses 5 through verse 15. I can't read all of it. Time doesn't permit. So let me allow, just allow me to just touch on some of the movements of it and be done with it. You look at verse 5, then you go on through to verse 18, but beginning at verse 5 is the unfolding of what Ezekiel sees. And it reminds us that when you are powerless, God is all-powerful. Listen to some of what he sees on this summer day when the heavens split open and there is a lightning show upon the bosoms of eternity and a summer thunderstorm as he sees the lightning play a zigzag game across the bosom of eternity and he sees what looks like a man 
but the man has four wings connected to four creatures. Beneath the wings are hands, and each creature has four faces. The face of a man, the exalted position of God's creation of humanity. The face of a lion, God's exalted position of the wildlife. The face of an eagle, God's exalted aspect of that which rules the sky and ox, the exalted position of that which is larger and stronger in the domestic life. And in it, God sees four, and that's a sacred number in the scripture. It points to God's completeness. And the image of this strange vision of what we see of this strange image, these creatures with four faces and four wings connected and then moving effortlessly in one direction and then effortlessly in another direction reminds us of God's energy and God's intensity and God's ability. It points out to us that God again is all powerful. I need to know that, and we need to know that, and it's hard for us to imagine that, but we know that God is all powerful. A couple of weeks ago, we discovered in Texas that decided that it would build its own energy grid and be independent of the east and west grids that feed the other states in America. And when the winter storm came, we who were supposed to be the most powerful with one grid that would feed one state compared to two grids that would feed the other 49 states discovered that we were not as powerful as we thought we were. And that it reminded us in our energy arrogance that there's only one somebody that has all power. You squeeze that into the human situation and there are some of us who believe that because of our intellectual acumen or our financial abilities or our muscular strength, but God has a something to come up against all of us to remind us that we need a power that's greater than ourselves. When you're powerless, God is all powerful. And when you think God is over there, God's really over here. That's verses 15 through 18. Because when he looked, he didn't just see creatures, but he saw a throne, the power of God. And on that throne, or carrying that throne, creatures. But then he saw something. Ezekiel saw a wheel in the middle of a wheel way up in the middle of an air. Ezekiel saw a wheel that reminded him that when you think God is over there and God has forgotten your address and God has abandoned you, that the God you thought was over there is right over here. Remember, Ezekiel had been trained to be a priest. So his theology, his God talk, the way he thought about God was in limited geographical local terms. And so he thought that God was in the temple. And now he's in Babylon, so God's over there. And I'm over here. And then news comes to him that the temple has been destroyed, and if the temple is destroyed, where is God? 
And God gave him a vision way up in the middle of an hour, and he saw wheels intersecting in wheels to remind him, when you think that I'm over there, I'm right up here. When you think I've forgotten you, I'm here in your human situation. And just because you don't see me, feel me, or hear me, doesn't mean that I'm not here. The gyroscope gives us the image of this, a device that measures and maintains orientation based on the principle of angular motion. That regardless of how you turn the gyroscope or you tilt it, it's always tilting, but it never loses orientation. It just simply means that however you turn it, is always turning without losing orientation. <laughs> it's a wheel in the middle of a wheel. And it's God reminding us that no circumstance not only prevents his accessibility, but no or disorientation causes him to lose orientation for your life. God gives you what you need because God, when you think he's over there, God is here. You say, what does that have to do with anything? It has to do with everything. A pandemic, twisted, poisonous politics, we haven't gotten away from that. Danger in our streets. Lost jobs. Poverty. And all of that makes you think that God either doesn't care or he's forgotten. Well, when you think that God has forgotten, he hasn't forgotten. God who's over there, no he's not. God is right here. Let me sit down now. There's something else in this. When you think that God has forgotten or God can't remember, God knows all about it. In, those, in this vision, you look at verse 18 and you see a grotesque, what looks like grotesque image. And it says these wheels are full of eyes. Eyes around the wheels. I mean, when you think about that, that's, that's kind of uh, a strange image, to say the least. I mean, you paint an image like this, children probably will run. You want to send them to bed, this is a good way to do it. But these eyes, remember that God sees all and reminds us that God knows all. My God is watching all the time. Let me, let me close now. My time is out. This image now, when you look at verses 19 following the chapter 2, verse 2, just simply points out one thing as it summarizes the previous verses that God is wholly other, that God is completely different. The image of the wings, the chariot, the throne, all of this points to that God is holy other, a term that one theologian uses, holy other. I like that, that God is completely separated from all other gods, demigods, quasi-gods, semi-gods, all of these gods pale in comparison to him. This image reminds us that God knows everything. God is everywhere. God has all power. It's one reason that I believe in God. I always enjoy reciting the, uh, the confession when we come to the Lord's table. I believe in God. It allows me to reaffirm 
that God has invited me and my response is to the invitation that he's extended to me to believe in him. I believe in God, the Father, creator of everything. It is what helped me make a decision to put my confidence in God. One of the things that the scripture points out is that there were many other gods. And the psalmist on one occasion reminds us of these gods that have eyes that cannot see and ears that cannot hear and mouth and lips but they cannot talk legs and they cannot move there are many other gods but this is the only God that makes this self affirmation that he knows everything he's everywhere and he has all power to do everything in these last verses you see the symbol the sign and the sound in this story you see the symbol of the throne you see the sound of the wings and then you see the symbol of a rainbow that's wrapped around this vision that Ezekiel sees. I like talking about that sight, sound, and symbol because that one symbol of the rainbow reminds us that the promise that God made in Genesis, he's kept it now in exile in Babylon. And we will see it again in the revelation that God will keep his promise all the way to consummation. And notice when the rainbow in his vision appears that God reminds us of his presence and his power and his all-knowingness. Sometimes Genesis, after the storm, Ezekiel, in the storm, then revelation before storms. Whatever position you may be in, it just reminds us that God is accessible to us and he comes to us. I'm done now. But it's hard for me to read Ezekiel and get to this and see how he responds to what he sees. He falls down in reverence and reticence. He falls down, and in doing so, he sensed God calling him to serve him in new and dynamic ways. I'm done. But that's not the only time this happened. There's another vision in another place on another island. Here you got Ezekiel, and he's on a dirt in a dirt hut on a dirt mound next to the river of Kabar. But here you have another vision, not of a prophet but of an apostle, not in Babylon but on Patmos, not by the Kabar River but by the Mediterranean Sea. And 700 miles away east across the desert stands Ezekiel, but now across the Mediterranean looking at the looming city of Ephesus is John up there. And John too has a revelation and in that disclosing, he sees something. He hears a voice that sounds like rolling waters. And then it is so enormous that it knocks him down almost like a dead man. And when he hears his voice, that voice reminds him you see Ezekiel's image, but let me let you hear the voice, I am Alpha and Omega. In fact, what Ezekiel was looking at, I'm the fulfillment of. He has signs and symbols. I'm the resurrected presence. What you're looking for, I am it. And today I don't have to look for nothing else. Because everything I need has been fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. And that's the reason why I love him today. It's because in Christ, all of my needs and hopes have been fulfilled. I have come to him. And so now I sing Ezekiel saw the wheel with a different vision and with a different vitality. I'm not just talking about some vision of a wheel in the middle of a wheel. I'm talking about the fulfillment of that wheel. I know who that wheel is. 
That will is alpha. That will is omega. That will is the first. That will is the last. That will is the beginning. That will is the ending. And everything that you need is in that will. And I don't care what you need. All you need to know is God got it. Isn't that good news this morning that everything you need, God has it. If you need hope, God has it. If you need joy, God has it. If you need love, God has it. Have I got a witness in here? God got it. Everything that you need, God got it. Ezekiel saw will. Way up in the middle of the wheel, in the air. But good news is, he doesn't have to stay up there, does he? God has come down to us right here. Our Father, we thank you for a vision to remind us that you are in our location, our vocation, and even in the times of need or loss of companion, you are Lord of everything, and you are completely holy of it. People today need that, I need that, we need that. And so now we pray. As the Holy Spirit is doing his work, people will respond to make a decision for Jesus Christ. And we thank you for who your son Jesus is, our Lord, and what he will do in the life of others that will trust him. In Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. And all God's people say, amen. The door of the church is open. And this morning, I want to invite you to make Jesus your choice. I want you to do that. And you'll be glad that you did. God has made you for himself. And you'll never find peace and rest and hope until you rest in him. So I want to extend this invitation to you to put your trust in Jesus. How do I do that, Pastor West? I believe in God. I confess with my mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord, and I can be saved. Pastor West, I, I'm a Christian, but I've strayed away from God. Today is a good day to come back to him, come back to God. Pastor West, I'm a Christian. I don't have a fellowship that I belong to. I need one. I want to invite you to make the church without walls your choice today. Several weeks ago, I talked to one of our men in our church. He had to bury his father, and then he had to turn around and bury an uncle and turn around, and he had to Barry, I think, uh, if I'm not mistaken, a cousin or auntie. I remember the conversation's content, though, and I said, I have been praying for you, and I prayed that God, and I just told him, I'm covering you in believing prayer. He said, thank you. He said, but you know, I've been with you for a long time, and I said to my family, the word of God has prepared me for this difficult moment. It's not that I'm not sad, but the word of God has prepared me for life and death. And I said, man, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. He said, yeah. He said, and I was talking to some people, and they said, you know, I don't think I would ever go back to church once uh, we can because I enjoy being at home. He said these words to me, and this is not... Th th these are his words. He said, I told him, I said, I can understand that, that you're making a decision like that. He said, I could never make that decision because I'm not a part-time Christian. He says, uh, I'm full-time. 
And I told him, I said, I'm going to use that one day. He said, he said no, nah. he said, I'm, I, I mean that. I'm not a part-time Christian. I'm not a part-time church person. He said, my wife and my children, they know it. if you live in my house, that there, there's no part-time worship, no part-time. This is who we are. And I didn't get into a diatribe with him about his ecclesiology or his understanding of church and God. I said, it's amazing what happens to people when they're in Christ, how certain issues are settled. This morning, you may have been a part-time Christian, and today God is calling you to full-time service. He said, don't just love me on Sunday. Don't make me the fulfillment of a religious obligation. Don't squeeze me in. As another group in our church told me, it was fascinating, it says, no, when we get up on Sunday morning, we actually get dressed to go to church. And, um, you know, in secular people who in sales know what I'm about to say is true, that people in sales will tell you even when you're not working in the office, that sales people get up and get dressed as if they're going out into the marketplace because it does something to the psyche. When I was a young preacher and I didn't pastor, I would actually get up every morning and get dressed like I was going to the office. Every preacher that meets me, a young preacher, they'll tell you, I tell them two or three things. One, get up like you're going to the office to work and work on sermons every day until the Lord call you to be in a place. Prepare yourself that way. And so... Today, those of you that are listening, God is calling you to say, prepare yourself and come to me now. Choir is going to sing. While they're singing, this gives you a chance. Look on the screen. You'll see membership, and uh, it has how you can become a member, um, our prayer request, whatever the needs may be. You feel that in. You send it, and we'll respond to it today. We're praying for you. Choir's going to sing. Welcome in advance to the church with our walls. Jesus waiting. waiting on you. Hallelujah. Live in your life today. today. Welcome to the church with our walls, but more importantly, and to the family of God. And thank you on this day for your word and witness. Church, let's prepare to express our love for God and to God through our giving. And we give not to pay bills, not to keep lights on. It is our expression of gratitude, our tangible expression to God to say thank you for being God, for your protection and for your provision and for your prevision that God sees our needs before we even know about them. So we thank God for that. Let's prepare to give our gifts to the Lord and we say confessionally where there's a temple, there's a need, where there's a need, there's a, what is it? Where there's a temple, there's a need. Is yeah, that it? And where there's a need, there's a provision. And where there's a provision, there's, and where there's God, he'll supply in miraculous ways. It's offering time. Praise the Lord. Let's give our gifts 
uh, at home and here. And then uh, does Haley have, Haley, do you have something that you need to say today? Thank you, Pass. Church family, we have a lot of awesome events coming up. Stay tuned to hear more. Now let's see what's new beyond the pew. It's time to hashtag get grouped in small groups. Grab your laptops, iPads, and start your journey towards spiritual growth and discipleship. Walk with God in a master class with Paz. Become a disciple in a discipleship group. Steward your finances in Financial Peace University. And so much more. Don't forget to grab a friend. Virtual small groups begin at 7 p.m. What are you waiting for? Sign up for a small group today at sgbs.tcww.org. Guys, it's time for you to get a grip and stand for truth at our Real Manhood Breakfast and Conference. We want to bring men of all ages on their walk with Christ through a one-day virtual experience of praise, worship, and encouraging fellowship. Register online today at men.tcww.org. Thank you, Haley. I think that's it. It's time for us to uh, do whatever we do on Sunday these days. Again, thank you so much, all of you, uh, for the day. And uh, let's prepare to go into the world and serve. Things sure are boring now that the football season is over with. My goodness. There's nothing to bother y'all about at this time. I'll think of something between now and next week. Look this way. Let me bless you as we prepare to go into the world and serve God as salt and light. Uh, we're praying for our church family. We have experienced some serious loss. James Harris sent me a list. Um, and so we are praying uh, for you, uh, deaths and uh, loss in our church family, our circle has been affected uh, seriously and significantly. And so we're praying for you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to smile upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift the light of his countenance upon you and grant you his peace. And may the Lord bless you when you go out and come in, when you rise up early and settle late in your labor and in your leisure, in your laughter and in your tears until that day when we shall stand at the feet of Jesus where there's no sunrise or sunset. God bless you. I love you, church. Have a great, great day.